Why do we see so many more strikes in European countries than the US? Earlier this month, the UK just had a day labelled Walkout Wednesday. It's going to be marked in history as hundreds of thousands of workers went on strike to demand better pay and working conditions. And while there's a number of cultural, political and economic issues that cause these strikes, surprisingly one of the best ways of explaining this is using maths. And specifically a branch of mathematics called game theory. During a strike, a worker refuses to fulfil their duties as an employee in order to protest against their employer. Typically they do this to improve their working conditions or pay. For example, the long-standing strike by the UK teaching union was spurred on by a change in the pension scheme. Or the historic nursing strike was spurred on by low pay and excessive working hours driving nurses away from the UK health service. The key thing to notice is that in all of these cases, the strike is organised by the trade unions. These are organisations that aim to bargain on behalf of employees. However, before going on strike, trade unions go through a series of negotiations, and that's where game theory comes in. A branch of mathematics that aims to understand the science behind strategic thinking, it studies how agents or players apply strategies to achieve an outcome to their benefit. Originally developed to study economic interactions, it's now applied to fields such as biology and cancer, to international relations and of course employment disputes. Let's look at a simple game of rock, paper, scissors. Each player has three different options with the typical rules we're familiar with and we can represent the results of a combination of their actions in a matrix. In this case, either player 1 wins, player 2 wins, or there's a draw. So let's apply this logic to understand what happens in the context of a single worker. This worker is underpaid and unhappy, so they approach their employer for a raise, and this is the first game. We have a worker who wants to maximise their salary, and an employer who wants to minimise their costs. Clearly these are opposing interests, and these types of games are called social dilemmas. Here choosing to satisfy one group would be to the detriment of another. In our simple game, the worker has two choices. They can either compromise with the employer's decision, or they can make demands and stay steadfast. And the employer also has two strategies. They can either award the raise, or they can refuse. So how would this look on a game theory matrix? In the first case, if the employee is willing to compromise, and the employer offers a raise, we'll see that the employer suffers a cost, and the employee gets a benefit. But since the employee was willing to compromise, they might not get as much as they demanded. But what happens if the employer refuses the raise? The employer benefits as they save money, but the employee suffers as their demands are not met. But in the case the employee refuses to compromise and to stay steadfast on their demands, we can see that the employee receives a greater raise when the employer is willing to give it, which is different to the previous case where the employee was compromising. But the final case is the most interesting. The employee refuses to budge, and the employer refuses to give in. In this case we see a breakdown in a negotiation because there's a disagreement, however in the case of a single worker this is a problem. The company might not be worried by a single striking worker, since the effect posed by a lone worker is quite minimal. This seems to contradict the fact that we see strikes in the UK, so why is this? Well the answer is collective bargaining. This is when a group of workers band together to negotiate with their employer. Instead of having a single inconsequential worker striking, we potentially have an entire workforce leaving. And this type of action can have catastrophic consequences with the UK rail strikes costing the hospitality sector over £1.5 billion. This is where trade unions come in, they usually organise this type of action, and it completely changes the game. So how does our matrix change? Well instead of having a single worker striking, we potentially have the firm's entire workforce. So let's go through each of the four options. We can see when the workers are willing to compromise and the firm gives a raise, the firm has to give a higher cost since they're paying each and every worker but the benefit to a single worker is still the same. So now if the firm refuses, they're set to save a significant amount of money. But if the trade union's not willing to compromise, the firm would have substantially higher costs. And finally, in the case that neither side can agree, instead of having a disagreement where a worker is unable to strike, the trade union has more power and they could trigger industrial action. Since firing your entire workforce is not possible, for each worker the strike is actually a smaller cost relative to the firm. In these types of negotiations, if the cost of a strike is less than the cost of a raise, the firm would be more willing to accept the demands of a trade union. So a balance has to be struck between the trade union's demands and the employer's willingness to pay. And this is precisely the negotiations that are being played between trade unions and employers in the UK currently. So going back to the original question, we know that UK workers are able to strike because they have access to trade unions, and this answers why we see less strikes in the US. The rate of trade union membership in the US is significantly lower than the UK, and it's generally lower than most of Europe. This means that the negotiations we see tend to favour the employer rather than the employee. And in recent years we've seen companies such as Amazon actively trying to play the game on their own terms by stifling workers' attempts to unionise. Obviously this is a simplistic explanation of a nuanced complex phenomena, but you can see by using maths we can start to understand the world around us. And in fact maths can tell you why your friends are more popular than you. Click here to find out, or learn more about the history of maths in this playlist. Consider subscribing and thanks for watching.